first thing we had a discussion on was what do we call the session. And I don't know, when I was told Francis Crick, my first description which came to my mind was the word maverick. So I said, oh, Francis Crick, maverick scientist. But somehow they felt that it was not enough respectful. And so we went back and forth and reached this conclusion of calling it as a visionary, multifaceted uh, uh, scientist. But uh, subsequently, I actually looked up the dictionary meaning of the various words. I mean, because actually, he really is such a diverse and a multifaceted personality that it is uh, difficult to sort of pinpoint or describe him with one adjective. And uh, so when I look up the, actually, the you know, meanings in the Oxford Dictionary, it, uh, you know, visionary is a person with original ideas about what the future will or could be, but it has a kind of supernatural connotation to it also, you know, like you could be predicting things out of not having any background, you're seeing visions and you're saying things. And so I thought a Renaissance man would be better, so that, which is what I have given the title of my talk. And so the Renaissance man is somebody who does many different things very well, which again fits in Francis Crick. But I still think that the word which really, really describes him really well is a maverick, which the dictionary meaning is, or a, a person who thinks and acts in an independent way, often behaving differently from the expected or usual way or where most people would behave. And I think that actually is the crux of everything that Francis Crick did. And I'll give you one example of that. I mean, I actually ended up doing a lot of reading and looking up into old papers for this talk. And uh, so this is uh, Francis Crick, of course, when he was much older. And you could see that you know, he was, even when he was asked to give talks, he was sort of very articulate and very demonstrative. So obviously, he was a very, very popular speaker, especially after having got the Nobel Prize in 1962. So how would most of people, when you, know, they, you are invited to give talks or asked to do all sorts of things, once you are famous, uh, you, know, you just send an apology note. But what Francis Crick did was, because he was so overwhelmed, but basically he had this pre-printed postcard which, you know, in which he had outlined 17 different kinds of invitations which he could possibly receive, and he would just tick off one of them. And some of the very unusual and you know, odd things, like autograph is not, and lecture is not such a thing, but he was asked to heal a disease and accept honorary degrees, etc., etc. So he had this pre-printed card, and apparently his secretary or he would just tick off one and post it off. And I think that itself is a good example of how unusual he was in reacting to things uh, as compared to you know, most of us. So to go back to the beginning, his full name was Francis Harry Compton Crick. Of course, we just know him as FHC Crick or just Crick. And he was, as I said, he, was, he would have been 102 years old this year on June 8th in Northampton, England. And he died in July 28, 2004 in La Jolla, California, USA. And he was born in a small town in England and you know, with a kind of uh, class structure which actually Britain has, it was really a big thing for him to even you know, kind of get educated and come up because his father managed a shoe and boot factory and his, which he had inherited from his own father and mother was a school teacher. But what is very interesting, and I, I hope there are still st um, no, there are quite a few students, which I think uh, this first sentence should be very encouraging for them, because he graduated from the University College of London in 1937 with a second class honors degree in physics. So I, you know, in India, if we don't get 98% marks, people think that you know, they are a failure. I, I think this should be an encouragement to them that it does not mean that you know, just getting high marks is not essential to do good work in science. And so this was one of, again, unusual features of Francis Crick's career. And then he took a graduate work with his you know, basic BS, BS degree was in physics. He started up, you know, they call it graduate work there for PhD in physics at the same college, UC London, on the viscosity of water at high temperatures. But he actually found it extremely boring. He was not sort of involved in it. And luckily for him, since this was during World War II, the, a bomb fell on the lab and his equipment got destroyed. So he very happily gave it up and didn't, you know, with no regrets about his lab, you know, was were getting disrupted. And then during the war, he actually designed acoustic and magnetic mines for naval warfare. So once the war got over, then that was, you know, like about two years after the war got over, he 
sort of didn't know what to do. And uh, so he had an undistinguished record in the field of physics, and he decided to change his career. So there again, you know, we would just probably go and talk to our seniors or you know, try to get some mentors. But what Francis Crick did was, he, as he himself admits in his book, What Mad Pursuit, published in 1988, he says that in making his decision as to which field he should work in, he applied what he called the gossip test. And the gossip test, according to him, was that what you are really interested in is what you gossip about. And he found that when he was talking to people and everybody, he was mostly talking about biology and things related to biology. So he decided that he would move from physics to biology. And there again, he, you know, he had a dilemma, because he found two topics extremely interesting. One was molecular biology, and the other was mysteries of consciousness. Now, you know, for most of us, those two fields would be very, very far apart. But for him, as I will show later on, it actually made sense. So he was debating between those two. And he, he admits, actually, again, in one of his writings, that the intellectual adjustment required by his transition from physics to biology was almost as if one had to be born again. Uh, that, I think, is a little this thing, because I think many of us, especially in the molecular biophysics unit at ISC, are all physicists turned biologists. But I think it was people like probably Crick who made that transition easy, that it became very acceptable to change from physics to biology or chemistry to biology. So that is, was his thing. And out of the two then, he chose the former. And why did he choose the former? Because, as he said, that his choice of molecular biology is you know, well described or summarized in statements, again, what he has made later in his books and articles, that, as he says, almost all aspects of life are engineered at the molecular level. And without understanding molecules, we can only have a very sketchy understanding of life itself. And so, out of, so for the time being, he set aside the consciousness part and took up molecular biology. And he also goes on to say that all approaches at a higher level are suspect until confirmed at the molecular level. Today, I think we, are, we, don't, we don't stick by it so much because, you know, developmental biology and, you know, there are a whole lot of other techniques for which even if you don't understand phenomena at the molecular level, we still get a very, you know, fairly some depth, in-depth understanding of life. So, he, once he decided to get into molecular biology, he actually changed over in 47, 48. He started applying to MRC, which is the Medical Research Council in UK. And he was lucky enough, even with a second class BS degree, to get, and he didn't have a PhD, he, he didn't have anything. He just applied for a fellowship to MRC. And with, a, as I said, a basic undergrad degree in physics. But he still managed to get a fellowship from the Medical Research Council. And he decided to work in the, the MRC unit, which was based in the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. And subsequent to that, that was really the flowering or you know, led to the full-fledged expression of his work. And his whole life's work can be divided into at least half a dozen different distinct areas and time periods in which he worked, which is summarized in this, and which I'll try to cover at least the first parts in some little detail. And of course, the classic work, and the one for which he is most famous, is the discovery of the double helix. So as I said, he joined actually just in around 1948 in the MRC. But as you, for three years, nothing much seems to have happened. But in 1951, began his collaboration with James Watson. Now, James Watson was an American postdoc who was the other extreme. He had got his PhD at the age of 23. And he was interested, again, in molecular biology. He, in, he was actually a, like, you know, one of the freelancing, what we call backpacker kind of scientists. And he decided to, you know, he had traveled in Europe. He found that people were working in Cambridge on DNA. And somehow he was fascinated. He was a geneticist, so he was fascinated by DNA. And he decided to go and basically he just sort of wedged himself into the Cambridge group. And so he was basically, uh, you know, uh, 12 years younger than Francis Crick. And interestingly, most of the work, neither of them did any single experiment, actually. So it was just long conversation at their, you know, they shared, luckily for France, both of them, they were given a common office. So at their shared office at the Cavendish lab, and apparently, they, you know, in fact, this pub still exists in Cambridge. If any of you happen to go there, you can see there's a plaque outside also commemorating uh, Watson and Crick. 
So their, you know, their conversations in the lab as well as over lunch at the Eagle, a, a pub near the Cavendish. Essentially, they say that that is where the structure of DNA was elucidated. And of course, the paper was published in 1953. Incidentally, Kirk also earned his PhD degree in 1953. And that was actually on the topic was X-ray diffraction polypeptides and proteins. And though it's sort of, you know, it's not openly acknowledged, but he has a classic paper called Cochrane, Crick, and Vand where in Acta Christ, where they had actually worked, he has collaborated as part of his PhD thesis. They published an article on how does the fiber diffraction pattern of a helix look like. And to some extent, that was actually very instrumental in elucidating the structure of DNA because he had a good solid background in fiber diffraction work. And also, it didn't come out of a vacuum. As I said, just to put it in historical perspective, it's not like the DNA structure fell out of heaven or it came out of the blue. Prior to that, that in the early 50s, structural biology or structures of biopolymers was uh, like a hot topic of research. And everybody across the Atlantic, both in USA and in UK, and even to some extent Europe, a lot of people were working on various biopolymers. And of course, the first you know, impetus had come from Linus Pauling, who had proposed the structure of the alpha helix in 1951. And he was also working on, in fact, the structure of DNA. And in fact, Watson and Crick were having a very, very active competition with Linus Pauling. Unfortunately, Pauling actually proposed a structure, published a paper in 19, early 1953. It happened to be the wrong structure. It was a triple helix with the phosphates on the inside. And that was, you know, that turned out to be the wrong structure. But that also provided an additional in, impetus to Watson and Crick that they must hurry and publish the correct, you know, arrive at the correct structure, because otherwise they'll be beaten to it. And I should also, I mean, just being in the Indian academies, uh, talk and even otherwise, I like to point out that parallel almost to these two, especially parallel to the DNA work, was also work done in India by Professor J.N. Ramchandran sitting not at Cambridge, not at Caltech, but at University of Madras. And he actually had elucidated a structure which was much more complex, in fact, than either of these two. And that was the coiled, coiled triple helical structure of collagen. Incidentally, Crick also collaborated with Alex Rich in providing a slightly modified version of the collagen structure, which also is a quite highly rated work. OK, so now this is very common thing, but I thought just in case there are non-biologists and young students here, I'll just quickly summarize this, that apart from the fact that there were other structural, a lot of structural biology work going on, what was also going on was what pro provided inputs to Watson and Crick for their structure was that, uh, you know, Erwin Shargaff's work in 1952, which had actually shown that amount of guanine is equal to cytosine and adenine is equal to thymine. And that is what led Watson, primarily Watson, not so much Crick, to figure out that probably there is this linkage between guanine and cytosine and adenine and thymine. And, and this also then meant that since these were isosteric, they could easily be accommodated in a double-stranded structure. The other input, which of course was very important, was Rosalind Franklin, who was at King's College London, working away on this fiber diffraction pattern of DNA. And she had got multiple pictures of DNA. And unfortunately, she was concentrating on what she called the form, the A pattern, which later was associated with ADNA. And she, but she had this iconic photo, which was called icon photo 51, and which she called as DNA B. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, she had, she had the picture for six months, but she was a hardcore trained crystallographer. And with apologies to crystallographers, they somehow, at that point of time, at least seemed to have problems in uh, you know, something which couldn't be solved by very traditional, classical, crystallographic mathematics. They could not uh, sort of approach this problem properly. They missed the alpha helix bus also, that's why. So uh, she kind of had this picture, but she couldn't. But because of Crick and uh, you know, background in developing the math mathematics behind the predicted pattern for a helix, Watson also had that exposure. And when he was inadvertently shown this photograph, either inadvertently or deliberately shown this photograph by one of Franz Franklin's colleagues, Maurice Wilkins in King's College, he immediately could make out that this, is, this classic X pattern here and a diamond pattern in each half is a you know, it's like a signature. It's like a fingerprint of a helix. 
So these facts sort of, you know, A equal to DGC was put together by Watson and Crick to arrive at ATGC. So this was, as I said, one of the first examples where without doing any experiment, somebody was able to kind of get to a very important finding and get Nobel Prize for that. And this was their classic paper. But and as you can see in this, you know, they don't actually have any atoms or anything. This is just a schematic of the DNA helix which they presented. At the end of the paper, they made two statements. And, but they had built this model, which is like a steel model of the DNA. And so this was in 1953. Initially, they had also built a model in which the phosphates were on the inside. But then, as I said, one look at the X-ray pattern, and they kind of came out with the correct model of having the bone on the outside and the base pairs on the inside. And, but neither in their paper nor in a, though they make a statement saying that coordinates will be published later, they actually never published coordinates. It was Morris Wilkins' lab who, something like six years down the road, actually came out with the first set of coordinates for the DNA structure. And, uh, but, and for that reason, perhaps, uh, Wilkins was sort of clubbed with Watson and Crick to get the Nobel Prize in 1962. And by then, of course, Rosalind Franklin had died of cancer, so she couldn't just think. The other important aspect of the work, of course, was that the immediate implication of the double helix was, a, they, you know, even Watson Crick realized that, and they had this statement in their paper that it has not escaped our notice that the specific base pairing scheme immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. And this was the, you know, sort of the immediate implication of the watson Creek double helix and the base pairing was that you had the semi-conservative mechanism for DNA replication, where you have one parent molecule, it falls apart, and since there is this complementarity in the base pairing, you end up, you can end up with two, you have two fresh daughter molecules being formed, and that is how the genetic material gets transmitted from parent to progeny. So this was the immediate implication, and it kind of is, this is what is considered not so much the DNA structure per se, but the implications for replication and the kind of information transfer which it automatically suggests that led to the real ferment and is supposed to be the birth of molecular biology or modern biology. And then, so having finished the DNA structure work, Crick then applied his mind to, you know, further uses of it, and how does the DNA lead to, you know, what is its role, how does it, not just for DNA replication, but how does it cause other, and I think Shankar has already talked about this in detail, so I won't uh, spend much time on this, so, but only thing what he had said was, I don't think anybody looking at DNA or RNA would think of them as templates for amino acids, and so that's why he suggested that there must be an adapter molecule which acts as a bridge between the DNA and the protein. And the word actually, adapter molecule, was actually given by Sidney Brenner. And tRNA, of course, the word tRNA was coined much later. And so, OK. So having defined, you know, sort of having worked out a little bit, he then went on also to talk about how the genetic code would lead to protein. And again, it was all speculation. As I said, Crick never actually did any experiment in his whole life. So he then had another paper, the paper which Shankar mentioned was also an unpublished work and to the DNA or RNA tie club. And he then had a presentation at University College London in 57, in which he proposed the sequence hypothesis. And it said that genetic information is encoded in the sequence of bases in DNA also. So it's not just replication, but it's also other information. And the next challenge then was to decipher the code by which the four-letter code, that is the ATGC four bases of DNA, are translated into the 20-letter code of the amino acids. And so that was fine as far as it went. But one place where actually Crick made a little bit of, uh, you know, he couldn't really uh, appreciate was that, he, you know, he assumed that the information, once transmitted from DNA, probably through mRNA, and used to assemble the amino acid chain could not reversely flow out of the protein and affect the sequence of bases in the RNA messenger. And this came to be known, that is from, you know, DNA to DNA, uh, the duplication or replication, but then also from DNA to mRNA transcription, and then from mRNA to protein translation via the, you know, tRNA. So this sort of got coined, I mean, it became really a dogma. 
And to some extent, it probably held back molecular biology by a few years, because today, of course, we know that information can also flow from RNA to DNA, and that is through reverse transcription. And so, and uh, the other thing then was that, okay, even if we assume that you go through, tRNA got established as a molecule, but what exactly is the relationship between the DNA sequence and the protein sequence? And for this, again, he, DNA, you know, he has a Nature article in December 1961, where, again, with Sydney, along with Sidney Brenner, he describes how the chemical code embodied in a gene consisted of groups of three bases which do not overlap or share bases. So each set of three bases, actually, uh, he suggested you know, code for uh, an amino acid, which, of course, we know to be true today. And again, he did not foresee, the, as I said, RNA to DNA or reverse transcription, but otherwise. And you know, it's, again, reverse transcription is not something which happens routinely, but it is known to happen in, you know, it is a mechanism used by RNA retroviruses, such as HIV and some tumor viruses. OK, so what was it that you have a DNA triplet code for amino acids? That is, you have each bunch of three bases which are coding for you know, a particular amino acid. And of course, you have redundancy here. Sometimes you have more than one triplet code coding for it. And then the amino acids are carried by tRNA to the ribosome and joined together there to form the protein molecule chain. So this then became known as the central dogma of life part two. That is, DNA, essentially it implies that DNA carries all the information in its nucleotide or ATGC sequence through this codon mechanism. That is, each set of three bases are coding for an amino acid leading to the protein sequence. Is it that, I mean, again, is it as automatic as DNA replication is in that sense? And we know today that, you know, that's not true, that, you know, the, the genomic DNA also carries a lot of punctuation marks or information about various regulatory elements and which are involved in transcription, replication, and translation. So, okay, so in some sense, Crick had major contributions all the way from, you know, DNA to tRNA to how it codes for the protein and what happens. So from genes to proteins, every step of the way, Francis Crick made major contributions. And in 1977, then, he shifted to Sark Institute for Biological Sciences at, to California. And he also shifted his focus from molecular biology to his other field, which he had been interested in right way back in the 1950s, and which was neurobiology, or as he called it, consciousness. And there again, he had built up some, you know, he was extremely good at collaborating with others. And here in particular, he collaborated with a computational neuroscientist called Christoph Koch, and studied the visual system of humans in an attempt to uncover the neural correlates of consciousness and, you know, a whole lot of cerebral cortex and how it gives rise to the subjective mind. And he published a very interesting book, actually, for those of you who might be interested. He actually published seven books altogether. But uh, two of the most famous ones, I think, are one is What Mad Pursuit, which talks about the DNA double helix and the astonishing hypothesis and scientific research for the soul. So he actually related consciousness to soul and tried to sort of say that how human beings are kind of a little bit different from other animals. And so he published this in 1994. And he was not as productive here as he was in the field of molecular biology, but he still kept working and apparently was editing an article just before his death in 2004 at the age of 88. So this kind of is, a, I think, a real quick summary of his you know, career over 50 years. But I thought just to uh, bring out the human side or aspect of Crick as a person and Crick as a scientist and what happened at that time, and especially in today's uh, day and age when we are very more, much more conscious of some of these issues. So one of the things was that one thing for which both he and Watson got a lot of criticism was that a statement, Watson anyway in a book which he wrote called The Double Helix had run down Rosalind Franklin like anything. So he kind of, uh, you know, and then I think Crick also kind of agreed with most of that. So in his retrospective, How to Live with a Golden Helix, which is an article, he, you know, he talked about Rosalind Franklin's approach to science, saying, namely, she was overly concerned with producing definitive experimental evidence before drawing conclusions, which today, I mean, we don't, we wouldn't consider it as a negative thing, 
but they thought that, you know, that is why she missed the bus. And they, they sort of wanted to this. And then, you know, he, he admits that their attempt to build a model without her data was a fiasco. Because as I said, they built a model with four switches on the inside. But then he goes on to say that what was important was not the way it was discovered, but the object discovered, which was the DNA structure. And misleading data, false ideas, problems of personal relationships occur in much, if not all, scientific work. Now, that can be a bit discouraging, I think, when one thinks about it. And today's day and age, when we see publications with 18 and 20 and God knows how many authors, uh, I think it would be, you know, but that was probably the age of more individualistic kind of science being done. And that was his personal viewpoint, which I think most of us probably will not agree with. So, but overall now, it is well accepted that Crick and Watson, with help from Wilkin, Maurice Wilkins, who was actually Rosalind Franklin's colleague, uh, they used Franklin's experimental evidence without her knowledge and without giving her full credit in their, especially in their first published paper on DNA structure in Nature in 1953. Incidentally, there are also some articles, in fact, which also point out to hear rather controversial views on eugenics. And the time of the Second World War with Hitler and Germany sort of exterminating Nazis on all sorts of grounds, he actually seemed to agree with some of them. And the point he makes there, I, I didn't want to put it down here in writing, was that you know, there will come a time when we will want to do selective uh, you know, selection of human beings. And I don't know, today also we are talking about you know, gene editing, etc. So maybe we are agreeing with what he said at that time. And the other, uh, other idea, which today we know was not quite correct, is he had a paper again in 1980 called Selfish DNA. And the word selfish, junk, specific, and free. So the words used in that two reviews which he wrote, out of which selfish and junk aroused strong feelings. A lot of people objected to it, especially classical geneticists. And, but of course, then he elaborated or explained his idea by saying that specific for him means that if you change any one of these bases in that fragments, you always have an effect on the organism. For example, the recognition site for a restriction enzyme. And then at the other extreme are junk sequences whose deletion or extensive alteration would produce a negligible effect. Though he says that there's probably a continuum between these. But today we know when, you know, when the human genome has been sequenced, and which came out in 2001. And, you know, so we do know that there is a lot of, you know, as you go up higher order in the organisms, you, while the bacterial kind of things have a genome size related to the gene number, in the case of uh, you know, higher eukaryotes, especially human beings, we are somewhere here, and we don't have a kind of linear correlation. So the, and, but more important is that when you have the gene coding percentage, while prokaryotes are almost 80 to 90% of them are coding for genes, uh, eukaryotes, and human beings we know is only 2% of the thing is causing a gene. And in terms of number of genes, human beings are sitting somewhere between chicken and grape. In fact, plants in general have a larger number of genes than humans. And so in the case of humans, we have only 2% of the gene is coding for proteins. So if the, you know, if, it's, if only 2% of the human genome is this thing, what is the rest doing? And I think Michael Snyder of Stanford made this classic statement saying that differences in non-coding DNA, that is the intergenic DNA, and or stretches of molecule that don't code for proteins and were considered by junk, a word phrased by, coined by Francis Crick, they are actually what they shape what we are. And most of our regulatory elements, and that's why I was pointing out to Ramesh also that when you are doing genome analysis, et cetera, also, it may be expensive, but I think in some cases you would need to do the whole genome rather than only the coding regions. And uh, in, I, just as an aside, I want to mention that in, so in my lab also in the last 15, 20 years almost, we've been attempting to discriminate between various structural properties of non-coding versus encoding DNA sequences correlated with promoter regions and gene expression level. The reason why that comes up is because, again, with the talks which have gone before me, we've talked about non-BDNA structural motifs and, you know, not just the quadruplex which we talked about, but today we know that there is left-handed DNA, you have hairpins, you have triplexes, which are non-canonical, completely different from duplex DNA. But you also have local variability in canonical BDNA. And you know, that is like you, can, you have the opening bubbles, you have DNA wrapping around the nucleosome, and you have curved DNA, which you know, allows transcription to happen and you know, enhance 
allow enhancer elements, et cetera, which are far away from your transcription start sites to regulate the gene expression. And so to summarize my last two slides, if only 2% of the genome is coding for protein, what is the 98% doing if it is not junk? And some of the genome bases help determine its structure. For example, telomeres, which are quadruplex, and also some of the other parts position the gene in the right places to be read by the cell's machinery. And dark matter or junk DNA, is all kinds of important roles are being discovered for it. For example, there are ultra-conserved elements which have the exact same sequence for millions of years in mammals, and they are not the coding sequences. So then recent studies suggest that deleting these elements causes brain changes and could lead to some neurological diseases like Alzheimer's. And although we don't know why or how, but that's what's been observed. And again, up to 45% of the genome is actually leftover DNA from viruses. Actually, this was something, again, which Crick had kind of hinted at, because he said it's parasites and viruses which have that DNA has got incorporated over millennia into human genome, and that is why he thought it was just junk. We don't know yet what much of that old viral DNA. One would have expected that that would have got deleted, but it hasn't. So, but we know that it's contributed to at least one very important mammalian trait, and that is exchanging nutrients between mother and baby through the placenta. So that is not being done through genes. It is being done actually by this so-called junk DNA. And the rest of the genome includes regulatory elements, including segments that influence genes to be expressed at the correct time in response to environment, transcribed sequences that the cell needs but does not use for making protein, and of course, which acts as a hotspot for chromosomes to exchange information, so your recombination sites, et cetera, et cetera. So this is where my Crick part comes to an end. I think since I've run out of time, I will not, I had a few slides on my work, but I think I'll just skip those, which essentially dealt with, as I said, uh, non-canonical uh, DNA duplex structures. But I do want to uh, finish with this, that I would like to dedicate this talk because, again, as I said, as a physicist turned biologist, I think it would not have happened without the molecular biophysics unit being set up by Professor G. N. Ramachandran in 1971. And uh, incidentally, in 1922, he would have completed 100 years, and I hope the Academy will plan something for that year also. Finally, my acknowledgement to the lot of the information which I talked about here has been taken from Francis Crick papers in the National Library of Medicine, NIH. And my thanks to my, actually at the moment I have only two postdocs, but my you know, past lab members. This was just the lab last year. Because I just had one slide which actually showed Francis Crick when he visited India in 1964. And he's talking to Obed Siddiqui in Hyderabad. But I think I deleted it at the last minute. So. Thank you all for your patient listening.